we're going to go ahead and record. So the, we're going to cover the first one is 26. Uh, let me get it up real quick. Six. Oh, so I kind of already covered this one, but I can do it again. So on this one, we have two different types of circuits. We have a serial circuit and a parallel circuit. So a serial circuit works um, as essentially everything in a row. So if anyone has ever played around with uh, uh, Christmas lights, the old ones where if one bulb goes out, everything goes off, that is a series or serial configuration. So everything has to cap, uh, succeed and everything has to fail for it to be on or off. Or sorry, one thing has to fail for it to be off, but everything has to succeed for it to work. And so what happens is you have a plug. So power. You have first surge protector. Let's call it P. Second surge protector. Just Q and a TV for uh, a lazy evening. So long as uh, I have you have internet, like I did not have this weekend. So the chances of the surge protector working is 95% on each one. <coughs> so we have a surge of power. It goes to the first surge protector at a 95% chance of it working. And the second one, 95% chance of it to go working. So if they're arranged in a series, what's the probability that the TV will not be damaged? Well, the easiest way to find out this is when you realize you have that A and A not error, A bar. So A is nothing getting through. And a bar is electricity getting through. <clears throat> so we need to be careful on this because it's kind of weird. Um, we had to calculate the chances of your TV frying in order to calculate the chances of it not frying because it's everything else besides it frying. So that's how much it is, the probability of working. Here, so probability of not working here is one minus our probability. So one minus my probability. So the chances of it not working so now we have the chances of it not working to calculate that. We do one probability times a second probability. And that's a pro chances of the electric or the surge getting through both of them. So 5%, 5% gives us 0 0.0025. Wait, what? One minus P of the labels. Oh, oh, of it working. I'm sorry. And you have to make sure that your chances of it working. Let's see. So that's the chance of it failing. So the chances of it working is one minus this. So you have a 99.75% chance if you have two circuit breakers of it not, of it working. Which, if you think about it, is what most people actually have right now on their TV because you have a circuit breaker or surge protector on your house. And usually you have a surge protector before your 
uh, major appliances. So you end up having a very high chance of it not surging through. So this is if everything is in a low in a row. So this the other one is if it's a parallel. So parallel, you would have a power, and then you would have your P and your Q here. So your energy would go from here to here, or, or from power to P or power to Q, and then it goes back to the TV. So <clears throat> so since the surge protectors or are not after each other since the electricity goes through them at the same time and goes on to the TV, you have the probability of each one failing or succeeding as your probability of them working. So in this case, we can take the probability of it working is at 0.95. So this is P and this is Q times 0.95. So chance it failing. So I take that 95 times 95, and it gives us 0.9025. And that's the chance in a parallel of it failing. So this right here, 95 versus 0.9975 is why whenever we're trying to protect things, we tend to put them in a series. And when we're trying to make, just make sure things work, we put them in a parallel because this is easier to work with, but this is safer. This was 26. And then the next one people had questions on was 30. Yes, I do. I don't know why it's yelling at me. Okay, so this is a Pro, uh, basic probability, uh, number 30. So this one, um, so people, college students were given either four quarters of a dollar bill, you could either keep the money or spend it on gum. Uh, so what they have is they have four quarters dollar bill. And you can either purchase gum or keep money. And I'm just gonna make some numbers, 35, 12, and 15, 28. Not the numbers that I have in the problem, but it doesn't matter. Um, so they want you to know on this one, the probability of selecting a student who spent the money given that the student had was given four quarters. So whenever you come into one of these, usually, and it's good practice, what you need to do is to put in the totals. So equals sum, open parentheses of these two. And that gives us how many people have purchased gums. Uh, then I could click and drag over to get keep money and total. And then I can do the same thing over here, equals sum. And I do four quarters purchase gum and keep money, close parentheses. And I can drag down again. <coughs> so we have a total of 90 people. So it wants to know the probability of randomly selecting a student who spent the money. So this column right here, given the student has been given four quarters, this here. So it wants to know what's the probability of 
a purchase given quarters. So I need to take the probability here divided by this here. So it should be, in this case, 70%. And then I can choose, change stuff over here to make sure I'm right, to make or my whole problems right. So then it wants to know the probability of selecting a student randomly who had kept the money given four quarters. So since this has the same conditional probability here of the four quarters, you can do this two ways. You can do the same way where you take the number of people who collect who kept the money for, and divide it by your total, which gives you 0.3, or so x v or since I have the same condition of four quarters, I could take one minus my probability up here because it's the opposite one to get the same answer. So this should be 0.372. So the last part of this, um, it's asking, are students more likely to purchase gum or keep the money given four quarters? <coughs> When you have the same condition over here, quarters, you cannot make any assumptions about dollar bills. Uh, because we only looked at quarters, you can only draw conclusions about quarters. So because of this, you're more likely to purchase gum given quarters than keep the money. Paycheck. Okay, does that make sense? Um, are there any other questions I can go over? If that made sense, at least. Because a lot of these are kind of these type of questions. Cool. I like things actually making sense. And I and if you have this set up and then you'll have other questions, you could just set one of these up to do like a probability of purchase given dollar and just calculate everything out. Probability of keep given dollar, this divided by this. So you could do stuff like that. And then um, you could do the same thing with probability um, quarters given purchase equals this divided by this. And then probability of dollar given purchase. So you can literally just set the whole spreadsheet up to give you all your numbers, which is usually what I do when I'm doing these. And then probability quarters given keep 15 divided by 43. Probability of quarters or dollar rather given keep. <clears throat> and then you'd have the probability of all those events inside of each other. Um, 
So if you're looking at conditional probabilities, that's one way to get it. Because then if I change these to anything, if I get a different question, like, uh, are these all the same numbers? No, they're not. So if I, if I get a different question, I could literally have everything just change for me and then I could just go in and put in the numbers. So it's, if you spend a little time to make this, it makes doing these couple of homework problems really easy. Um, so what else? Anybody else have any questions for homework? Uh, if not, I see one that's number 33. How many do you have anyway? 43. So I'll do number 33, which is a disease one. Um, so this is one. <clears throat> so this is a test for a specific disease. So it has positive test values and negative test values. And you have I guess I should just put this down to one. X, V, and this is uh, have disease. Yes, no. So in here, you can have different values. Uh, let's do 146, 338, 120, uh, 32, uh, 156. So this one is looking at basically whether or not you have the disease given your test score or not. Um, so in this, we have a couple of different things. It wants to know uh, someone who tests negative uh, given that they do not have the disease. So it's looking for the probability here. But once again, you have to do the, prob the totals again. So equals sum, and this is a big part of epidemiology. For those of you who are going into nursing, uh, this is some of the stuff you end up having to do. It learn, turns into something called risk analysis, or, 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 or what is it? Relative risk and risk ratios. Uh, so there is some stats involved. It is a lot of these type of tables with percentages instead of just numbers, but it is what it is. So we have true negative, true positive, false negative, false positive. So these are the two, the four basic things you get when you give a test. Um, so true negative is negative test result and doesn't have disease. So that's what a true negative will always be. So this is the prop, this number here. We have no test on the test and no on the disease. Um, wait, group is randomly selected. Find the probability of someone getting a test. So we have that. Uh, so find the probability of getting someone who tests negative, given that he or she did not have the disease. And this, so it should be out of here. So if you do not have the disease and you test negative, it should be 98%. So if you get a no, you probably do not have the disease. Uh, same thing for true positive. When you test positive, but do not have the disease. So if you test positive, there's an 82% chance you have it. <clears throat> Let me double check to make sure these are, this is, I'm doing this right. 538, 123. So this would be, Six one. Okay, yes, I'm doing this correct. Always good to know. 
Uh, so false positive would be when you test, or sorry, false negative means you have negative test, but you have the disease. So in this case, you have 32 here, have it, and you count that based off of the total number of negative tests. So 17-ish percent. And a false positive is when you test positive. Wait, I did this backwards, I'm sorry. This should be, um, actually, I'm not entirely 100% sure. So I'm gonna look it up real quick uh, because I'd rather be 100% sure. Uh, false, negative, formula. Yes, yes. So false positive, one false negative. Probability that a true positive result will be missed by the test. False negative, 32 divided by false negative plus true positive. False negative two. Okay, so it is. Okay, so it is. I'm sorry. Oop, what am I doing? Oop. So negative here divided by your total. So your false positive should be the same thing. Your false positive divided by your total for not having the disease. So, uh, does, does anyone, while I'm doing this and going through this, does anyone have another any questions on specific num homework problems as I'm kind of going through these? Number 11. Don't know if I've gone over it recently, but I will do it. Okay, so we'll go number 11. And whether we've gone over it before or you just want to go over it, just let me know and I don't care. I will, I will go over it again. So, um, so you want to try to determine whether something can be cured by chance and then form a conclusion. So this is coffee on long-term memory found on 35 participants given 200 milligrams of caffeine uh, performed better on a memory test 24 hours later than a placebo group. I've done something really close to this with um, nicotine actually. So there's a probability, there's A, um, of point uh, probability um, of a difference of 0 0.049. So if there's a less than 5% chance of a difference, uh, if there, okay, so if there's a difference, and that the probability of that being due to chance being less than 5% is that is 5% something that could likely happen or not? That's what it's asking. Um, and if it doesn't, which it could not occur by chance, then there should be as sufficient evidence to conclude that it has an effect on memory. So in stats, 5% is kind of a magic number. Anything more than 5%, you generally start looking at things being able to be changed by random chance. Anything less, and it tends to not be. So if 
random chance is not likely to occur, then there is sufficient evidence to conclude differences are going to be different. Um, so if they give a 300 milligrams and they perform better than 200 milligrams, the probability of 0.75 that the difference is due to chance. So 75% is I have a 12 sided die here. 75% is like what? Well, times 0.75. Like 10 out of the 12 sides. If I can only hit two of these 12 sides and it, the rest of it has a chance, there's a very good chance. I'm going to hit one that's random. So if there's a 75% chance that the difference is because of dumb luck, then it's not going to be something different. It's going to be due, due to luck. Um, so because of that, there's no sufficient evidence to conclude that there's a difference between the two. So on this, I usually do a flow chart. So is it less than 0 0.05? If it's yes, then it's not due to chance and uh, sufficient and there is going to be sufficient differences between groups. If the answer is no, it's likely due to chance and is no, is not sufficient difference between the groups. And that's kind of the logic I used to do it is I just break it down, I hate to say it, into a flow chart. And if you do the same thing with the point, so on this one we go, is it less than 0.75? Yes, so I go here. So this is the question. Um, so the second one, the chance of the difference is 0.75. So you do the same basic thing. Instead of yes, it is no. So it's likely to do a chance, and there's not sufficient parts. Does that make sense? And this is, by the way, one of the more confusing parts of statistics is the, I hate to say it, the English part of it. Um, being able to tell people what happened based off of what you did. So, uh, and it's also poorly worded, I will say that. So, um, and this value, by the way, can change. So, depending on your field. Does that help Daniel? Danielle, I've seen both. Uh, okay, uh, other questions? Questions, comments, concerns? Complaints other than the fact I haven't uploaded the videos. I'm working on it. 12 and 20. Hey, it's relative risk. So 12. So relative risk. Okay. So we have uh, 
I was actually talking about this. That's kind of funny. Relative risk. So in this, we'll have uh, drug placebo. And so treatment. <coughs> Um, a headache, so this is a little bit different. So on this one, we're given a control group. Um, we have 15, we actually will have some of the totals. So I'm gonna make some numbers up and then check them real quick. So eight, 16, 80, and 25 reported headaches, so 36. So on this, I am given a total, people with a placebo. I'm giving the people who have reported headaches. So to find the people who don't have the headaches, I take the total and subtract the people who reported headaches to get the people who do not have headaches. Relative risk. Uh, then we had the total number of people who were given the drug, which is 30, I'm making some numbers up and uh, there and I have the same thing. I can do total minus yes. Uh, so then we do have to to add up the sums here and the sums here. And it wants you to calculate something called the relative risk. The relative risk, they give you a bunch of weird things. It's probability of T and pro oh, divided by the probability of C. C, uh, the proportion of headaches in the treatment, so P of T is proportion of headaches. And, oh wait, wait proportion of headaches in the treatment with drug, and then P of C, proportion of headaches with placebo. So the relative risk is basically, does the drug make a difference considering looking at a placebo? Um, so we do this by finding the probability of each event so probability of T and one divided by one divided by probability of T divided by a probability of C over or one divided by probability of C. So P of T or probability of drug given yes. We need probability of drug. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Not, it's probability of yes given drug. Because we are assuming you're in the control group that you have yes. Uh, then you have the probability of yes. I'm oh, sorry. No given drug. And we use this to get the top. So probability of yes, given drug is about one-ish percent. The probability of no given drug is going to be 99-ish percent. So what I do at that point, and this is the P of T, is I take the 1% divided by the 98%, and that gives me the top of the equation. So 0 0.01264. Then we look at the bottom. So this would be 
probability of yes given placebo, probability of no given placebo. In this case, we do that 36 divided by 16 or 1680 and 1644 divided by 1680. And then the P of C Oh, sorry. I did the plea of C. I'm just going to do it top and bottom. Would be this 2 divided by 97. So our ri relative risk is going to be equal to this number divided by this number, or 0.5771 which is not that bad. Generally speaking, uh, you want high numbers for it to be an issue. And let me go and double check this answer to make sure I'm doing everything right. 2063 and 28. And we had 1579 and 0.855. Um, and then they want the odds ratio. But they don't give you the odds ratio formula. Lovely. One second. That would be really annoying to actually go through and get all the relative risk and then they don't give you the odds. Give me a second though. EG1, probability of group one. We're not doing that. Maybe it's under risk ratio. They don't. They don't give you. Oh. Okay. So the odds ratio. Would I be, I take my headache divided by my total. Wait, it is the same thing. And I take my placebo divided by my total. And my odds ratio. would be the odds at the top divided by the odds at the bottom. And let me double check to make sure I'm correct by changing these again. And this is 25, Point.
And that is correct. So that is the correct way to do these. So the odds ratio is looking at the odds of each one, the drug and the placebo, and then dividing the two. The risk ratio looks at the probability of each event with some math and returns that result here. Oh, not very easy. And then there's a third one. <coughs> and because this numbers, these numbers are not above one, they don't really, uh, really pose much of a risk. So if those numbers are equal or pretty close to one or less than one, then that shit, your your ratio, you're pretty safe with, uh, compared to what you are using as a placebo or as another drug. No worse than what you're doing. There we go. That's the word. The next one is Q20. Oh, the one I do. So. This is the fast food restaurants. So so we have four of them. <coughs> and we can see if their order is accurate or order not accurate. So once again, we're gonna want some totals here and totals here. So I'm going to make up data. Hit that. So I'm gonna sum up everything again. <coughs> so I don't always know if I'm gonna use the totals, but I like to have them in case something pops up. Okay. If I'm trying to figure out An order being accurate from McDonald's. So that's probability of accurate given McDonald's. So I have to choose based off of the McDonald's data. So in this case, I have 354 orders that are correct out of 379 total orders. So that would be my order of correctness. Let me actually double check this because I am wait. <coughs> oh, this is what's the probability of getting an order from A or an order accurate. Never mind. I see. So on this one, um, uh, to visualize this, I do like this. So these are the orders from McDonald's. Accurate or from McDonald's. So these are all the numbers. I don't need this highlighted. These are all the numbers. that I care about when <clears throat> finding my total number. Unfortunately, the order accurate for McDonald's is the same. Uh, so what I have to do is remove this number, this 354 from my total. So to do this, the easiest way to do it is P McD or total McD or sorry, probability McD plus 
plus probability of accurate minus probability of McD given accurate. And this is from the grand total. So probability of McD would be, I take the total, 379, divided by my grand total, and I have 30-ish <clears throat> percent chance of getting probability McDonald's. Probability of accurate is 1,164 divided by 1,258, or 92-ish percent. This is not working out. Actually, yeah, it is. Probability of both. So 354 divided by 1258. So that would leave me with um, this part right here equals this plus this minus this. So 94. 4.5% chance of getting an order that's either accurate or from McDonald's. So in this case, let me double check to make sure that this is right, because I have to look at the numbers here. Eight, 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 30, 10. And mine, it would be 0 0.9010. Yes. Um, so, <coughs> and then it's going to ask something about um, uh, disjoint events. Uh, so, disjoint events is are those uh, values tied to each other or not? Since I'm fairly certain, and I will double check. Um, where is not that? I want to be sure before I say it, and I'm not backwards today. Um, so basically, these cannot occur at the same time. One second. Okay. Uh, so, a disjoint events do not overlap. So, since those overlap, since you have an order that can be accurate through McDonald's, those are not disjointed events. So, those, um, because it's possible to pick an order from restaurant A that is accurate. So that is that is there hope that helps on those two. 12 was kind of a doozy, and so was third or uh, 20. So <clears throat> uh, any other questions on these? Let's save this. Anyone have anything else, or are you guys' brains about fried? Well, 